So can everybody see the screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the, um, as you all know, um, Gabriel Foley is gonna talk after this about the Reading Bird Atlas progress and, and future. Um, I'll start off with some of the pictures that I've uh, seen that our members have taken since the last meeting in December. Some of my, some of the ones that I like. Let's see. So many of you have been able to see the Northern Shrike that was found by Mark Englund. Here's a picture that Stella T took at Blue Mash um, on December 24th, still around. Um, I think I said on group me that many people have had luck first thing in the morning, just after dawn, uh, looking across the pond at the, at the landfill and looking across there up in the, any of the trees up there. Um, Clive identified this model duck, um, maybe found it. I, I don't know. Well, just to, I mean, the, the, just to give everyone the details on what we know on that bird, um, there's a definite photograph of this bird from March 2021. Um, in, in Montgomery County, the photograph was taken from Scott's run on the Virginia side. But the bird was identified as an American black duck. Uh, there's a possible photo of it from November of 2020, again identified as an American black duck. And actually, we've uncovered, somebody found a blog of DC area wildlife, and in it is a picture of a mottled duck from several years ago from Arlington. So it's quite possible this bird has been around for several years and just has been overlooked. Um, we don't know what it's been doing in between, you know, last March and Christmas time, and it's not there right now, as the canal has frozen up and probably has moved on to the river. So that's the story of this duck. It's been hiding in plain sight, as they say. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for IDing it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> congratulations. And also taking a nice picture. <laughs> I always like red-headed woodpeckers. This was the same area. And so I guess Suzanne was also looking for the model duck, probably mm -hmm. found it. It was a woodpeckery area, I thought. I like this picture of the horn lark that Robin Skinner took at the Skinner hotspot. Because um, it looks like she's down on the ground. Yeah eyeing the bird at uh, ground level just a few feet away or something. But uh, in actuality, um, it was on a hill and she just was lower down from the hill and took it at eye level sort of, uh, but it's a nice picture. So some of you probably noticed that I have rare bird alert almost every other day about this pine warbler. So I thought I'd actually show it. Um, here it is in December at our house, and it still comes by even when there's snow looking for food. It's the same one. Um, Cooper's Hawk by Jim Ivett. Nice pose for this guy up in Darnstown. He lives at our house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, must have good birds around. He likes to clear the clear the uh, feeders routinely. <laughs> <laughs> I have one too. <laughs> Evelyn took these pictures of uh, American widgeons up at Gunner's Lake. It was kind of interesting because it's always had lots of birds, but as the water has been uh, as it's been colder, the water's frozen over and squeezing the birds into a smaller and smaller yeah. patch of uh, open water. I haven't been up there recently. I imagine it might all be frozen or it was a day or two ago. But. It was, you know, about the, uh, more, more, than, more than the back half was frozen, but there was still quite a bit of space. Uh -huh. But my hands were getting pretty, pretty much frozen. <laughs> um, Pictures of the Lap and Long Spurs um, by Dave Roberts that were at uh, Hughes Road this um, a couple of days ago. Looks sort of it has like, a very artistic. Uh, exactly. Looks like it's on a, a silk print or something. Yes, absolutely. 
and there's also there's been this model duck too that's uh, been at Carter Rock. Here's another nice picture by David Moulton. Then I'm going to go a little extra liminal here. There's a uh, snowy owl that many of you I hope have had a chance to see down at Union Station. Uh, I'm not sure now how long it's been there. Four weeks, five weeks, um, maybe longer. Um, this is a picture that Nathan T took. But there's some really good pictures um, that have shown up of this bird in different publications as well. Okay, those are the birds I have pictures of. Now I'll do a little bit of science for January. Not happy science though. So most of you are aware of this study that came out in 2019 in science by Rosenberg and all showing the decline of um, approximately three, 3 billion birds, about 30% of the birds in North America. And they broke it down into different habitats as well. So the only habitat that saw birds numbers increase were wetlands, but everything from coast to especially grasslands saw a decline in the numbers of um, birds. And you can see on the right side, the percentage of species that declined. Let's see, can I? Let's see if I can get the pen up. Yeah, so for example, grassland proportion of species declining is like three quarters of all species that use grasslands are declining in frequency. Um, birds along the coast, only 50% only, uh, of the species declining. And um, in here on part C is the total numbers declining. So anyhow, um, in the latter half of 2021, a paper came out in uh, uh, ecological ecology and evolution, looking at a similar uh, study in Europe. And they found some similar findings. Their decrease in population was less in terms of absolute numbers. I don't know how the numbers total compare between Europe and, and North America. But as opposed to losing 3 billion, they've lost um, um, I don't know, 600 million or something. So agriculture and grassland, again, are the ones that are hit the hardest. I don't know what how unclassified is defined. And then some of the other areas like boreal and inland wetlands have uh, lesser numbers, um, lesser percentages in general, although the tundra Myers and Moorland is, is pretty high compar comparable to the, the grasslands and agricultural areas. So it's not, the loss of birds is not limited to the North American populations, but also is uh, declining in Europe as well. This just shows that if you break it up into abundant species, common species, scarce species, and rare species, it's the abundant species in, in A here um, that show the, the greatest decline in numbers by percentage in column C, it's the uh, change in population is greatest among the, the common species. Scarce and rare birds, if there's any silver lining, aren't declining as much, but then they're not starting from as great a, a number either. So here, in total, they lost, they lost uh, in this study, 600, they measured the loss of 623 million birds um, estimated, most of them as land birds. Scott, doesn't there need to be something showing how much these habitats, how much of the habitats have been lost? Because yeah, there's been some development on the coasts, but there's probably still a lot of, you know, beach territory available as opposed to grasslands 
which have been much more developed. So it's not just the birds that have gone down, but the habitats where they thrive. Has there I been think, any matching up? Well, um, I don't know the numbers for that. They, um, and I don't recall them discussing that in the paper in, in terms of numbers as opposed to just generalizations. But I think that that's probably true that both in North America and Europe, you're seeing the decrease mostly in the grassland birds um, because we're losing large areas to farming and so forth. Um, and I'm thinking that maybe there's not such a decrease say in inland wetlands um, or maybe even boreal forests in Europe because it's been developed longer um, and, and the birds have adapted to uh, those decreased areas, but that's just a, a, a hunch on my part or a guess, as opposed to the North America well, that, where everything is, is being threatened, all, all um, types of habitats. Scott, does the, um, does, does the European Union paper distinguish between birds which are kind of broadly resident and those which are migrants? Because I know the general talk is over the last sort of 40, 50 years, a big decline in the trans-Saharan migrants. In, so, in the yes. so if you look at migration strategy, thanks for setting me up. Um, the long distance migrants have suffered the greatest number in terms of absolute numbers and as well as the percentage but even residents have a, a pretty closely similar pretty similar absolute number of uh, lost birds the percentage is about two-thirds of of the long distance migrants um, i'm not exactly sure what a short distant migrant is but as opposed to a resident but um, it must be because there's also a partial migrant within Europe. So the short distance migrant is losing the least, um, maybe within a country or something. I'm not sure what that means. But yeah, the long distance migrants are suffering. So I, as, I, uh, as I showed, they, um, some of the the most abundant birds are suffering the greatest losses. So you can actually see that the, the one with the greatest decline is the house sparrow. The Western yellow wagtail is next, and then the Eurasian um, starling. So I think in the US, the um, House sparrow is also in decline. I don't remember about the starling. I should say in North America. I don't, I don't know about the starling. So. We send them a few. Sorry? We could sit, uh, package up uh, some house sparrows and starlings and send them over. You could, you could do that. <laughs> um, And it's not just in the Northern Hemisphere as well. So a, a study just came out at the end of the year as well. Um, a 30 year study from 1983 to 2010, looking at Magellanic penguins at the, this colony at Punta Tambo in Argentina. It's a little less, um, well, they have a lot of data. Um, what they've looked at are three things, the effects of, well, in this graph, three things, predation, rain, and heat on the survival of chicks. The level of predation is fairly constant with some uh, highs and lows. Um, there were two years where there was a lot of rain and when the chicks um, below a certain age, sorry, above a certain age where they're protected by being, um, protected by their parents uh, hovering over them. So after that age to the age where they leave the nest where they've got their down and outer feathers where they're not as susceptible to the rain. In that middle age, um, they're more susceptible to the rain because then they get wet and then they die by uh, freezing at night or when the temperatures go low. So 
Um, let's see what's going on. So you can break this down into uh, different categories, starvation, predation, rain, and heat. All years, they uh, tend to suffer from um, starvation. The average is about 39% uh, of the ones that die are from starvation. The um, outer pink arrow, uh, or shading around the arrow is uh, one standard deviation above that 39% average. So um, sometimes, um, or many of the times, it's up to that uh, level in the pink. Uh, predation, not so much variability, about 9% die. Um, the rain, as I said, affects at a certain age, between nine and 23 days when they either don't have the protection of their parents or the protection from having grown feathers. And you can see some of this variability is due to those couple of days where there was a lot of rain deaths, but climate change will increase chick mort uh, mortality through more storms, bigger storms, colder nights after the rain and uh, breeding synchrony. And I'll explain that in a second. <clears throat> and heat is a, uh, a factor in a small proportion of the deaths. These don't quite add up to 65% because they're some unclassified or ones that couldn't figure out exactly how they died. So um, this is a paper that was in PLOS One. The title was Climate Change Increases Reproductive Failure in Magellanic Penguins. So the Magellanic, Magellanic penguins are still abundant, but the number of penguins breeding at Punta Tombo has declined more than 20% since 1987, and that's just as 2008. So I imagine that their decline has continued, but they didn't, um, they didn't talk about that in the paper. And I couldn't find really good numbers about that. Well, it was in the uh, Washington Post Health and Science yesterday. And I think it's gone from 400,000 pairs to 170,000 pairs. So that's that's quite a, now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, worse than I imagined that. So the climate change leads to more storms, which equals more rain and more difficult hunting. The hunting is more difficult in part because a lot of their um, fish that they hunt for have moved out of that area, um, I guess maybe further into the sea looking for uh, colder uh, environs, perhaps. So that adds to the hunting difficulties for, and starvation, as well as to uh, general overall stress. And when there's stress, there's less reproductive synchrony. And that means that before, most of the um, chicks were born within a, a short window of time. And, but with the stress, the, the chicks are born through a longer stretch of time. They're spread out more. So that means that more chicks could be exposed to uh, more frequent storms. And this leads to death from starvation and hypothermia. So the questions are, will penguins be able to switch from surface nests to burrow nests? Because if they're in burrow nests, then they're protected more from the rain than the surface nests where they're not. And, and some of them have uh, gone to burrow nests. And then obviously the overriding question is, will humans stop releasing carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere? That doesn't seem likely. Okay, um, 